for today is Psalm 150, the last psalm. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. Praise Him for His mighty deeds. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with trumpet sound and praise Him with lute and harp. Praise Him with the tambourine and dance. Praise Him with strings and pipe. Praise Him with sounding cymbals. Praise Him with loud, clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God, thank you for this morning. May we praise you. May we take this psalm and apply it. May we praise you with our lips. May we praise you with the instruments. May we praise you in our lives this morning and through our week. Hear our worship, Lord. Clean our hearts with the clean water of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's sing. Please stand and worship with us. <laughs>
completely missed my point. I apologize. And the words are a little bit different. <laughs> We're making
We are finishing our praying in the Bible, praying the Bible series. Uh, we are looking at chapter nine and ten of the book. Nine is like a page and a half, and then ten is about ten pages or so. I hope you read it. If you haven't, that's okay. You can read it uh, tonight or tomorrow. Uh, but do read it if you have not read it, because it is buttons up the whole book, right? It's the last chapter. And gives a much needed kind of cherry on top. Uh, but we're going to be looking at it a few different spots, mainly chapter 10, chapter 9, again, just kind of a, a brief kind of transitional chapter. We'll be around a few different passages, as has been our habit, and then next week we are going to be back in Acts, which I'm looking forward to quite a bit. So, Chapter 9 starts with a quote. John Piper's in this book quite a few times, and he says, Praying the words means reading or reciting scripture in the spirit of prayer and letting the meaning of the verse, letting the meaning of the verse become our prayer and inspire our thoughts. And that's really the, the gist of the whole thing, whether it's a psalm or any other passage of scripture, is taking that and making it our words and not kind of falling back on our own habits and ways we've prayed before. Not necessarily that those are bad or good, I don't kind of think, oh, sinful and righteous, but rather better, you know, good, better, best sort of thing, that we can have a deep, meaningful prayer life. That was what he was pushing early on in the book, and it really does help, it really does categorize and form our prayer far more deeply than just kind of relying on our own heart. So praying the scripture, reading the scripture, of course the Psalms are the easiest way to do this, not only because there's 150, but it also has a wealth of knowledge, poetry, and the like. We'll be looking at three parts today. Probably be slightly shorter sermons. We've got Lord's Supper as well as Fellowship Meal at the end. But we're going to be looking at George Mueller. Might be famous, might be known to you in his prayer life. Christ on the cross, his last prayer, and the early church example. So, Whitney, again, he does kind of summarize what we know and what we learned in chapter 9 and then jumps into chapter 10 where we'll see the bulk of it. He also quotes another man, Ken Langley, for 30 centuries, God's people have found it in the Psalms to answer the disciples, to answer the disciples how to pray. Lord, teach us to pray. 30 centuries, right? So it's another thousand plus years prior to Christ. Christ is also praying the Psalms, the early church, and everyone else since, not everyone, but many. So it's not old, it's not new, it's very old. Right? And that's something that we have a God who we serve, who's the God of reality, the God of creation, and the one who is not this new religion. We don't serve a God that's the new kid on the block, as it were. Rather, it's a historical faith based on facts. And a lot of people don't see this, a lot of people think it's just kind of wishy-washy or just faith or it's just make-believe whatever you want or they act as though church is just something we can create however we feel our service and what we do and how we worship but God has a very particular way in which he calls us to worship him so George Mueller 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 very famous um, spanned pretty much the whole 19th century born in 1805 died in 1898. He had many different ministries. Probably the most well-known was when he helped children. Now, unlike today, where there's many social services, there were just children that were either stuck in factories, you know, Bennett and Gwen, say, well, maybe not Gwen, but certainly Bennett and Joanna and Amelia and everybody else, 10-year-olds, 12-year-olds working in factories or parents who either abandoned them or died or had a war or 
something like that, and they were orphans, and they just wandered around. This is, this is what England was like. And sadly, still many parts of the world are like that, even today. England, not so much now, but it was not that long ago. And so Mueller had the heart and the desire, he was a pastor and other uh, things as well, and he had the desire to help children, to help these small, innocent children, imbibing James's words, orphans and widows and their distress. But he prayed, he routinely prayed, and there's many biographies, if you don't know him, he's a great biography to pick up, there's many on them that are very detailed and also very kind of uh, entry level. But if you've not read a biography on Mueller, or it's been a long time, I urge you to do it. He is a stellar example of faith and just, just, just Christian life. He's just, he's wonderful, it's a great, great testimony. But sometimes we look at people like George Mueller who just prayed and things showed up. In fact, he has a book of over 50,000 prayers of answered prayers. And I believe it says 30,000, yes, 30,000 were answered within that same day or even hour. But sometimes some of us, most of us, if you're like me, you look at that and you think, well, I mean, I can't do that. Right? I, 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 can't, I can't possibly act that way. Like, he's a super Christian. He's a prayer warrior. He's, he's a Jesus freak or, or whatever. He's a, he's a mature Christian. And we kind of put these qualifiers and we think, well, you know, and I don't know if that's just because we don't think it can happen or maybe we're trying to be lazy or justify ourselves, I don't know. But there is no distinction in the scripture of, well, these types of people, these mature, so, so-called, and well, everybody else. We like to do that in our world, but that's not the case for the scripture, not the case for Christ followers. Either we follow Jesus very imperfectly, right? <laughs> Or we don't, right? We're either Christians or we're not. And now a lot of times we, we struggle in sin and we wander in our sin and we do this or that with our sin and kind of keep the little pet sin in the closet and let, let it out sometimes. But as I said yesterday at the men's breakfast, which was a great time, and it's something that I've heard off and on, be killing sin or your sin will be killing you. You have to kill your sin. You have to work at slaying that beast that is the sin that so easily entangles us. Lest we forget, even early in the pages of Scripture, God tells Cain that sin is like an, an, an animal crouching at the door. Now, unlike today, there's not many animals around, although, depending on where you go, I guess, in the United States, you might still find a bear or a mountain lion. But imagine just random beasts around. We would have to be far more... Careful. Although Brad was just telling me yesterday where they lived in Texas, there were snakes everywhere way back when. And what was it finally? You had a it was a copperhead just leapt out at your son's head, and you just and he just just barely missed it. You know, there's that's disgusting and weird. And, ah, like I don't want to deal with that, right? But that's that's what sin is. Sin is like that beast that's ready to strike you, bite your face, and kill you. And so we either have to be killing our sin, or it's going to be killing. Us. So, Mueller, of course, back to him for a moment, is very, very consistent in his prayer life, very meticulous, and he's writing this. Now, I understand it's the 19th century and there's less distractions, but we can take much heart and apply much of what he did. Write down your prayer request and then write down when they're answered. Maybe you do do this. I've gone in and out of doing this. I haven't done it lately for whatever reason other than just inconsistency or laziness. I don't know. But it's something that when you see these things, you can go back and see the Lord's faithfulness. And then it encourages us once more to press on, fight the good fight of faith. So whatever it is, why we don't do it is, you know, whatever it is, it's not biblical. Now, I'm not saying you have to do it, and if you're not doing it, it's not biblical. But what I am saying is if you're craving these things, we can have a much more deep, robust prayer life like Mueller did. So his example is something that is astounding. 
There's one story that goes, now they have thousands and thousands of orphans. And there was no food for the breakfast. And of course he prayed. And in short order, they thanked the Lord for the food that wasn't even there yet. Now he had prayed, and of course there's workers and children are living there. They've, they've built multiple houses and multiple places on this property in Bristol, England. And there's a knock at the door. You might know the story. And a baker said, hey, I, I made an extra, some several loaves of bread this morning. Just, I figured you guys probably would need it today. <coughs> like, if that's not proof God exists, I don't, like, just that one tiny thing. He didn't know. He didn't ask the guy. He didn't tell the baker. He would never make his prayer requests known financially and other things until it was the end of the year and they kind of had their, their books and people would know a little bit more. But what he did is he prayed fervently to the Lord and the Lord went out and told people, right? And convened with those people and contended with their spirit through his spirit. So the baker shows up, right? No, no, oh, I don't need this bread. You guys take it. Hey, great. Praise God, we've got bread. And then shortly thereafter, a milk cart needed to be lifted. It needed to be lightened because he had too much and they needed to fix something. One of the wheels was broken. So, of course, they knock on the door again. Do you guys need milk this morning? Oh, yeah, we do. Thank you. Prayer answer. <laughs> I mean, again, just that one story alone in that same morning, both the bread and the milk, is just astounding. And yet, this is what God does. Mueller lived the book of James, asking without any doubting. Remember the first chapter? It's like the waves of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Don't be like that in our prayer life. Don't be so wishy-washy. Well, eh, yeah, right. I guess. Right? And we've all done it. But we don't have to do it. Right? We don't have to be stuck in those passions, in those reluctance. Is God going to answer the prayer? Well, of course He'll answer it. He'll always answer it. Right? Sometimes He'll say no. There's certainly more no's than yeses in my estimation, at least in my life. But that doesn't stop me at all, and it shouldn't stop you. It certainly didn't stop anyone in the Scripture who's walking faithfully with the Lord. And there is no caveat that Jesus says, well, you know, if your Father in Heaven doesn't answer your prayer the way you want, then just find something else to do. <laughs> right? There's, there's none of that. Mueller says, in the book, at all events, I almost invariably begin with prayer. But what is the result? I often spend a quarter an hour, or even a half an hour, or an hour sometimes on my knees begging, being conscious to myself of having derived comfort, encouragement, and humbling of soul, etc. And yet often, after having suffered so much from wandering of mind for the first 10 minutes to a quarter an hour, or even half an hour, I only then begin to pray. I scarcely suffer this way now. For my heart being nourished by the truth, being brought into experimental fellowship with God, I speak to my Father and my friend about things that He has brought before me in His precious Word." End quote. So he's talking about a then and now. I used to do this, I'd wake up, I, I'd spend 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, and just trying to focus, trying to get it, trying to get it, trying to get it, it's not working. And then he says, well, that scarcely happens now. I believe it's about 10 years or so is how he prayed kind of this way, just kind of ping-ponging back and forth. And I think most Christians these days, we do this, and then we think, well, prayers are very helpful. It doesn't stick. It doesn't work. It doesn't make me feel a certain way. And yet, there's never a caveat in the Scripture or from our Lord's lips that tells us anything other than to pray in this way. There's no, you know, get out of jail free card. We just, we're called to pray. But the way to do that is praying God's word back to him. That's one of the primary ways that we can focus and hone our attention. And that's what he's saying here. These things, 
were brought before me in his precious word. So that's an encouragement to me. This guy, a prayer warrior, thousands and thousands of answered prayer, right? Frittered, frittered away and bumped around and was tired and frustrated and eventually would get there. But then, now I don't really suffer like that anymore. I pray his word. So that's kind of our first point, looking at Mueller as example. Mueller's contemporary, Charles Spurgeon, also in England, also had orphanages, although he's lesser known for that. He said we should pray when we are in the praying mood. This is so Spurgeon. Praying in the praying mood, for it would be sinful to neglect such a fair opportunity. And we should pray when we are not in the proper mood. Why? Because it would be dangerous in the way to remain in that unhealthy condition. Right? Pray. I feel like praying. Yes, pray. I don't feel like praying. Pray. Right? Like, it doesn't matter. Right? Pray. It's like when you need a hug, especially with our kids or grandkids, our wives, our husbands. Hugs are great. Right? Amen? And sometimes you don't feel like giving a hug. You're like, just leave me alone. Or I don't want to give a hug. Ah, I'm just cranky. Neck hurts. Back hurts. Tired. But there, but but do it, right? It's, it's one of those just just do it, and then things change. So much better. So do we feel like praying always? No. But the solution is to pray. When we do feel like praying, well, the solution is to pray. He has many encouraging words here. Whitney does, the author. He even tells us when Mueller, he couldn't even get himself in the mornings, right? Often bumping around and just kind of slogging through his morning before he wakes up. So if he can't do it, right, don't feel bad. <laughs> You're like, ah, mornings are bad for me. Mornings are bad. I'm not awake till 10. I might get up at 6. It takes four hours for my brain to start. It's kind of how Jenny's been off the of <coughs> Right? Just on, yeah. <laughs> I'm on the other end. I'll fall asleep, you know, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, just pass out. But anyway, it takes a while, right? And we have to figure out, and knowing ourselves, knowing our spouse, but it's good to pray, right? It's good to pray with our spouse. It's good to pray alone. It's good to pray with each other. It's good to pray with friends. It's good to pray with the church. That's why we're called to do what we're doing right now. That's why we're here, to be reminded and fellowship and, 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 and sharpened in such a way. Christianity is not this solo thing. Not at all. That's a lie. So secondly, we'll look at Jesus on the cross. You want to turn to uh, somewhere. I thought I had the note. Uh, I believe it's in Luke. Christ at the crucifixion. It's one of the Gospels. He says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I don't think it's actually Luke. My apologies. Oh, I didn't write that down. Anyway, Christ is there. He's on the cross. And he calls out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, this might sound very familiar. It probably does. But it's not just Jesus saying something. He's actually quoting a psalm. Quoting Psalm 22. And he's there on the cross fulfilling what the Lord has said, what God has said prior to his crucifixion. When he writes on page 85 of the book, on the cross, Jesus said it only seven brief things. Said only seven brief things. The Roman soldiers had beaten him until ribbons of skin were flayed from his bloody back. He had barely been able 
to stagger to the place of crucifixion. He hung from the cross, severely dehydrated, and his entire body weight sagging on the three spikes that held him to the wood. He had to push on the spike in his feet in order to get enough breath into his diaphragm so that he could speak. But to do so was agonizing. And that he could speak only briefly before sinking back down. If the Romans wanted to hasten the death of the crucified, they would break the prisoner's legs so they didn't push up and would die of asphyxiation. In fact, this is what they did to the two thieves. Understandably, then, everything Jesus spoke from the cross was very brief. But the longest thing he said was, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So he's there on the cross. Now, Whitney says, and I, I would say I agree, although sometimes, you know, you're speculating, but that Christ prayed that. He was praying it audibly and then was praying it quietly to himself, obviously having to push up on your feet because your lungs were starting to collapse with the weight of your own body. Very painful. The word excruciating is actually invented to describe being crucified. So be careful next time you use the term. Same thing with the word awesome, right? God's only awesome. <laughs> Sometimes pizza's awesome too, but you know, we can find different words. <laughs> but excruciating is, is what happens when you get crucified. So choose your words wisely. He's here in excruciating pain. He's on the cross being crucified for the sins of the world. Dying for lost sinners. Dying a death that they deserve. And then giving them the life that he had. <clears throat> so there's always this, this exchange, right? It's not just only Jesus dying for my sins, but it's Jesus dying for my sins and then giving us new life. Sometimes we forget one or the other. Or both. Jesus is not just our moral example. He's not just one who is our friend, but he is our Lord. He is our sacrifice. He is the one who takes on the sin and gives us new life. Something far better and more rich in the scripture than what we might be tended to lean on in our own understandings. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now this goes through, and when he goes through, if you've read the book again, there's several instances where he talks about this was fulfilled, and that was fulfilled, and this was fulfilled, and so on and so forth. And it's so wonderful, and yet so, I don't know, confusing? Maybe not, maybe not the best word, but something that just, it just maybe mind-numbing is probably the best thing. That God writes the Psalms. Not just one, but multiples, but especially Psalm 22. And he goes through and he pictures this, and then he fastens this. I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds of prophecies that Christ fulfilled. And yet, sometimes we just kind of think, ah, oh, I'll pray later. Right. I'll, I'll think about that later. I'll witness later. I'll read later. I'll do later. But we don't have to be in indebted or stuck with our own emotions, right? I don't feel like it. I don't, I'm, just, I'm just not really in the mood. Whatever it is. Well, certainly Jesus was not in the mood to be crucified either, right? And yet he was. I mean, he prayed the night before, let this cup pass if possible, but not my will, your will, Father. And so he dies. He dies for the sins of lost, broken Rebels. <clears throat> King of the Jews. I mean, I'm tempted to just preach a whole sermon just on the crucifixion here. But Jesus is praying the psalm is what I'm getting at, right? He's praying this Psalm 22, the very first verse. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now for that moment in time, he did forsake Jesus, didn't he? He did pour out his wrath on his son. That we might die to that sin too and live to righteousness. 
Because what does the scripture say? By his wounds we are healed. Not his teaching. Not his good charitable deeds. Not his kindness or what have you. But by his wounds we are healed. We are shattered and crushed for our own iniquities in him. We all deserve the cross and worse. And yet, God chose this way to strike his son, to pour out his wrath on his son. So Jesus is praying Psalm 22 and likely continues to pray it under his breath, maybe in his own mind. We don't know for sure, but very possible. Thirdly, we look at the early church as well. Flip over to Acts 4. And at what the early church did, we looked at this last year at some point. Maybe it was this year, I can't remember. Remember, Pentecost has come in Acts 2. Peter and John go to the temple the ninth hour to pray. Chapter 3, chapter 4. Peter and John before the council. And we remember the story. They go, and they're there. And did you heal this man? And yeah, we did. Well, you just need to quit it. Just shut up about Jesus. Stop talking about this guy, this carpenter. And they're like, yeah, I mean, whatever. Whatever's right before you or God, you judge. We're just going to keep doing it, though. Okay, so you guys have a nice day. But before that, or excuse me, after that, verse 23 of Acts 2, he says, this is Luke writing, giving the account. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they had heard it, they lifted up their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, that means God's in control, he's king, he's, so, he's sovereign. Who made the heaven and the earth, so he's the sovereign creator, Lord, and the earth and all that is in, in the sea and all that is in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said, by the Holy Spirit, why do the nations rage, or the Gentiles rage, you might say? And the peoples plot in vain, the kings of the earth have set themselves, and the rulers will gather together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand pre-planned to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness, while you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, this place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. After they're interrogated, after they're yelled at, after they're threatened, they pray. They're there gathered, praying together corporately with others. God, sovereign King and Lord, creator of all things. This is why we worship God, by the way. We don't worship the local God. We don't worship the God of earth. We worship the God who is. The God who is present and near and yet big and majestic. God is the creator. That's why we worship him. Nothing else but the creator. There's material. This is why evolutionary materialism is so popular. Because it's the rival God to Yahweh. It is our current God in our culture. It will soon die, but might not be in our lifetimes. Regardless, they pray to this God, the real God. But then he says, and just kind of a little aside, affirming the Holy Spirit who authors Scripture. Right? Closely, what does he say? Verse 25, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit. I love that. Right? Like, it's just, and it's just there. And it's just there. We don't, you know, kind of like what I said on, on Wednesday, with the eunuch. 
Well, how is this guy worshiping God? Well, he's in he's in Africa, but he goes up to Jerusalem. And, like, did he know Jesus? But he was like he was a, he was he was damaged down there, and so he couldn't really be a Jew, and like or even a proselyte. But like, but like, how is he? It's just what it says. It's just what it says. He's worshiping God. Sometimes our theology crowds away, you know, and our systematic and this smart guy and that smart guy from history. Well, uh, it's like, just what does the text say? What does the text say? The text says that David wrote the, ser the, the psalm, your servant, who's a king, by the way, let's not forget David's a king, said by the Holy Spirit. Huh? I thought David wrote it. Uh-huh. Well, I thought the Spirit wrote it. Oh, well, yeah. But, like, David wrote it. But, yeah, no, he did. But, no, the Spirit wrote it. No, no, he also wrote it. They, they wrote it. Wait, what? <laughs> you know, sometimes in our mon mon mental 21st century, like, binary minds, we just, we don't like certain things like that. This often happens with salvation. How, who do you, who, how do you get saved? How do you come to know this? Is, is God saving you? Or is the, and gets with the election and predestination and just deciding this and that. It's like, repent and believe the gospel. You're a wicked sinner. Christ is a great savior. Believe on him and you will be saved. How that all hashes out in eternity past and at the end of time, I don't know. We're not privy to that information. Amen. Repent and believe the gospel. Doesn't mean we don't ask questions. Ask questions. You just might not get the answer, right? Or the answer you want anyway. So thirdly, this is our last point. They're praying. Psalm 2, aren't they? Why did the Gentiles rage? The people plot in vain. The kings of the earth set themselves against the rulers. Now this is particularly, sometimes people I think think this is future, even future from 2022. And, you know, we've got these giant nukes pointed at the sky. And, you know, we're stepping on crosses and, you know, tearing up Bibles and all these bad, evil guys are running around. Maybe. But this is already actually fulfilled here. A lot of the context, I think sometimes we, we see it's very, very distant, but in reality, the things that were distant aren't actually that distant. They were going to happen in the future, but that future is already passed in our time. It was fulfilled in the scripture. That's where most, I take, most predictions in the scripture. Not all, but most, far more than probably the average American. Because we like to kind of kick it down the road further and think, oh, that hasn't happened yet. Well, it actually has. It actually has. So the Gentiles are raging. Why are they raging? Well, because Christ is crucified. The peoples are plotting in vain. And then Jesus promises the gift of the Holy Spirit. He comes at Pentecost, and this is two chapters later, where the church is fully being realized, and the people of God, that have always been the people of God, right? It's just, that's what it means, it's the gathered body, that's what the ecclesia, the church, means in the New Testament. Same word, synagogue, in the Old Testament, or synagogue, technically. That just means gathered people. Gathered people who worship God. That's what it is. But this is being fully realized that it's not just the Jewish people, it's not just the Hebrews, but everybody is included in this thing. Doesn't mean you're automatically in, right? You have to repent and believe. You have to trust Christ. But you're part of that wild olive branch that we see in other places in the New Testament that is grafted in. And God says, I'll break off the natural branches for the wild ones if you guys are unfaithful. It's wonderful. So some scholars believe not only is he quoting, they're quoting Psalm 20, Psalm 2, but also Psalm 146. So the point is, George Mueller, he's praying scripture, right? He's praying the Psalms. Christ on the cross, his last words, right? He prays Psalm 22, and here, Psalm 2, certainly, and likely Psalm 146 as well. So if you're not praying the Psalms, please pray the Psalms. Your prayer life will be exponentially better. You will be more strengthened, more built up, and you will be emulating some pretty good people, right? Not just the early church, not just George Mueller, but our Lord himself. 
You can pray, like Romans 10, 9, right? If you don't know Christ, right? You can confess and say, I confess with my mouth, Lord. I believe that you were raised from the dead. That's how you can pray a confessional prayer. Or maybe those of us who are in Christ, which I think most of us are. But maybe, maybe a friend, that neighbor, that, that, that sibling or child. You can lead them in that way that it makes it personal. That I believe that you rose Jesus from the dead, Father. Save me. Because right, what does it say? If you confess through the mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. But it's kind of this third, you know, this third uh, party sort of third person, right? It's not personal. But if you pray and you say, Lord, I believe that you rose from the dead. I believe that you were crucified. You died and were buried. And then I will be saved when I trust you. That you will save me. Notice how we're first person, right? And there's this whole difference. And yet all we're doing is saying pretty much right in Romans 10, 9. Or 1 Peter 5. I give my cares and my anxiety, my trouble, my burdens to you, Lord. Save me. Save my friend. Save my child. Save my spouse. May he give his anxiety, his burden to you. May she know you, Lord. This is how we can pray for our loved ones. This is how we can pray for those around us. And or if you don't know Christ, or how you can lead someone through that way. Let's go to the Lord now. Father, gracious Lord, sovereign Lord, you are the creator of all things. You uphold all things by the word of your power. After making purifications for sins, you sat down, Jesus at the right hand of the majesty on high. Having become much better than angels, as a more, as, an, as a name you inherited is more excellent, more exquisite, more fantastic than theirs. The Father spoke to us in many ways and in many portions in the former days, but in these last days he spoke to us by you, Lord Jesus. You have been appointed heir of all things. You have also made the world. God, be with each of us as we are here, as we partake in your table. Wash our hearts, Lord. We are sinners. Nobody's perfect. We're very fallen short, but your grace and your mercy knows no bounds. And your faithfulness is new each day. May we not rage as the Gentiles do, the nations that do not know you. May we not plot against you and your will for us. Help us, Lord, to pray as you ought to have us pray. Help us to know that the Psalms are a good, wonderful, God-given book that we must not neglect. Shepherd us through these times, Lord. Even if we are in pain, we are frustrated, we are worn out and weary. But we are not weary yet, Lord. For you saw fit to overturn Roe v. Wade, which I am so thankful. May we praise you for this, Lord. May we know that the murder of the unborn is on retreat. And those who decide to destroy people for their own selfish gain. Is going into the darkness. But this is the first step, Lord. Help us to be faithful. Help us to rejoice even today. But to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Bless our time, Lord. Help us now to remember and proclaim your death until you come again, Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. All right, we are going to...